on uh, Saturday night because my costume, for those who didn't see it, was a huge big alien and then the alien was carrying me and uh, I had to sort of break it to them, I'm really sorry, but it was only air in the costume with me and myself. So there wasn't a person carrying me around all night. Uh, it was just me in there, but uh, as everybody filed up on stage and showing off their costumes, um, I must admit, I probably had no clue who most of these heroes were. Um, I'm not a big superhero movie guy. <clears throat> I re recognised a few, but uh, most of them I didn't. So, um, But when you, when you look at the definition of hero, it says uh, it's a person who is admired <clears throat> for having done something very brave or having achieved something great. So that's what a hero is. And, um, and I'm sure, you know, we all aspire to be like that in life from time to time. I'm sure, uh, you know, when we see a, a group of ducks, you know, with the little ducklings crossing the road, I, th I think we'd all stop and, you know, make sure they all get across safely and put on your hazard lights and alert others. And uh, rather than sort of barreling on through and hoping that they get out of your way, you feel good, you feel good when you stop and help out ducks crossing the road. And um, perhaps some of you might remember when Pastor Chris, uh, you know, helped rescue that man from the falling off the Port Nalunga jetty. Um, who remembers that video that they showed at Christmas camp and they sort of made fun of him? Do you remember that? Or am I the only person that... It was over like 10 years ago, but somebody has got footage of that video and hopefully we get it because uh, it, they sort of made fun of Pastor Chris, but he did a really good job saving that person that day. And perhaps, you know, sometimes we try and be a hero when we shouldn't really be a hero. For example... I had a leaking shower head and I thought, oh, I'll be able to do this, I won't need to call a plumber. And anyway, took off the shower head and I got the new shower head and I was sort of, you know, using the spanner and swinging it around, had the plumbing tape on and everything and I almost got it straight and then I'm like, oh, it's not quite straight. So anyway, I thought, oh, I'll just grab the, the rose and just sort of pull it a little bit and all of a sudden, boom, bent it. So the whole week I was having a shower, um, you know, with my head to, on a lean. Lucky I didn't ask Kevin to come and do it because probably he would have taken all my tiles and the whole shower apart and that would have cost me a lot more money. So, um, so yeah, sometimes we do try and be a hero when we shouldn't be. But um, I guess particularly tonight, I want to talk about a particular type of hero, which is what's called an unsung hero. And perhaps for the younger kids in the, in the hall this evening, they're probably like, what's an unsung hero? Is that somebody that's not singing and they're being a hero? But um, uh, my title for the talk is Not, Your, not All Heroes Wear Capes. And, um, and I guess an unsung hero is, um, is somebody who does exactly the same as a hero, but gets very little recognition uh, for doing the exact same thing. And um, Kevin on Sunday, he was talking about Nathan and uh, I was going to talk about Nathan too, but Kevin spoke about it on Sunday, so we won't go over it again. But Nathan's a really good example of a, an unsung hero. Um, same goes with uh, Uncle Mordecai, with Esther. He's an unsung hero. Caleb and Joshua, when they sent out the spies, they're unsung heroes. There's heaps of them in the Bible. Um, but I'm just going to focus on just a few tonight, but we could have uh, covered quite a few. We might get that clock going, if that's all right, Lee. Um, so we'll look, at, we'll look at 2 Kings 5 here. So obviously we all know this passage very well. The story of Naaman, who was a commander in the Syrian army, and uh, you know, he was a very well-respected man, but he had an issue, and that was that he had leprosy. And that was a condition that uh, it doesn't discriminate against how important somebody is or how not important someone can be. And um, this chapter very much talks about his healing from that. Um, but I want to have a bit of a, a different focus on somebody else as we're re reading through this story, and, you'll f and I'm sure you'll probably pick up who we're trying to focus on here. We'll read in verse 1. It says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honour rule, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valour, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out uh, by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, uh, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go, go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed, this is Naaman departing, and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. So king was saying here, off you go, Naaman. Um, go and meet with the king of Israel, who at the time was uh, King Jehoram. And uh, give him this letter that I've given you here. And here's a huge sum of money to help butter him up. 
and uh, persuade him to do what's uh, written in the letter. So that was obviously quite a nice gift. We'll read on in verse 6 and it says, And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. So <clears throat> obviously, you know, King Jehoram here, he wasn't too happy about it. Um, you know, he thought the king of Syria, who was Ben-Hadad, um, perhaps he's a long lost uh, relative of Pastor Phil and Chad maybe but um, you know he thought that this king of Syria he was trying to um, you know start a fight with him or, or trying to give him leprosy um, so he wasn't very happy read on verse 8 and it says and it was so when Elisha the man of God had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes that he sent to the king saying wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes let him come now to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel so, <clears throat> as we know, Israel, they had some very good kings and they had some bad kings. As we heard from uh, Brad the other week, he explained that very well. And, um, and obviously, King Jehoram, guess which category he fell in? He was uh, in one of the bad kings category. He didn't really follow God's instructions very well. Um, sometimes he did, most of the time he didn't. And that's why Elisha um, was there trying to help sort of talk some sense into him. Read on in verse 9, it says, So Naaman came with his horses with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha and Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying go and wash in Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean but Naaman was wroth and went away and said behold I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God strike his hand over the place and recover the leper are not Abana and Fafa uh, rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Then went he down, dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. <clears throat> so now we read all of this and we realise, you know, that a great uh, miracle has occurred uh, in the end for Naaman. He was healed by the power of God, but it took quite a number of people for him to get to that point. It took two kings, the prophet Elisha, it took Elisha's messenger, it took Naaman's wife, but probably the person who had the biggest impact in this entire story but is so easily breezed over and forgotten about is Naaman's wife's maid. Remember her, the little maid right in the verse 2 that we read about? And, you know, her attitude was really quite outstanding in, uh, in this situation. You know, she had all reason to be uh, angry, angry and, and bitter about the situation that she found, his, found herself in. Because, um, you know, imagine, imagine yourself if you're just uh, minding your own business in little old Woodcroft one day and it's um, between meetings and just going about your normal daily life, you're heading down Pimpala Road, you're going to Dulwich Bakery, you get a nice custard tart in the break, when all of a sudden a car pulls up and abducts you and they bundle you away and they put you on a plane and send you to a foreign country where you don't know the language, you don't know anybody, you never see your family again, and you're serving this, you know, army commander that you don't know. It's hot, it's sweaty, there's no air conditioning, there's flies that keep landing on your head and annoying you every two seconds. Um, it's not a good situation, but that's exactly what happened to this little maid, that uh, her life was turned upside down, and essentially, you know, she became a servant. And what's more, that the person that she was serving um, was a person obviously who had leprosy in, in the country that she came from this person was completely shunned from everybody else and they were you know they were seen as a diseased and a downcast uh, type of person nobody wanted to have anything to do with them so she also had that battle to try and get over you know the awkwardness of that situation as well and and we read in this passage that you know her attitude was completely selfless you know she was willing to help a person who had actually taken her captive and uh, she was the initiator of this great miracle uh, that happened for Naaman. You know, she told Naaman's wife, who told Elisha, and, and she could have just said nothing. She didn't have to say anything, but she was bold, and she knew that uh, she had a God that would back her up. So she was really uh, an unsung hero, I think. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. 
another well-known passage here. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to take a look at Ananias. And uh, whilst you're turning there, I might share a bit more of a modern day um, story of an unsung hero, although it's not really that modern day. It happened in 1983, before I was born. But uh, has anybody heard of the man called Stanislaw Petrov, if I pronounce him correctly? He's a Russian man. He, he actually died in 2017, and I'd never heard of him. So obviously, an un we have a person that's heard of him. Uh, for most of us, an unsung hero, but um, I'll read a little bit about him because it's quite interesting. So he was an officer in the Soviet Air Defence Forces, um, and his role was to sit in a control room and look out for any incoming missiles attack. Um, and if, they, if there was one, he was obviously to report it to his superior. So, um, and obviously they would then take uh, action and, um, and you know, launch a, a counter-attack. And obviously it would have been a pretty bo boring job most of the time. I'm sure he probably had, you know, playing Uno cards or whatever he was doing because uh, nothing much would have happened except for one day, September 26, 1983, where the planet came very close to a nuclear holocaust and it was the actions of this gentleman, uh, Stanislav, that averted the disaster. So I'll read a little about the report. It says, the Soviet Union's missile attacks early warning system displayed in large red letters the word launch. A computer screen stated to the officer on duty, which was this man, Stanislav, or Stanislaw. And he could say with high reliability that American intercontinental ballistic missile had been launched and was headed toward the Soviet Union. First, it was just one missile, but then another and another, until the system reported a total of five missiles that had been launched. Petrov had to make a, make a decision. Would he report an incoming American strike to his superiors? Because if he did, the Soviet nuclear doctrine called for a full nuclear retaliation. There would be no time to double-check the warning system and much less time to seek negotiations with the US. BBC report continues. It says but Petrov did not report the incoming strike. He and others on his staff concluded that what they were seeing was a false alarm. And they actually asked him after this whole event, you know, how sure were you that it was a false alarm? And he said 50-50. So there you go, 50-50. I think the Lord had a bit of a say in his decision making that day. And it was. The system mistook the sun's reflection off the clouds for a missile. So a computer error there. Petrov prevented a nuclear war between the Soviets, who had 35,000 nuclear warheads in 1983, and the US, which had 23,000 approximately. Later report was made that outlined what damage could have taken place if, he, if the Russians had gone ahead with the retaliation. A full-scale Soviet assault on the US would kill 35 to 77 per cent of the US population, or between 82 million and 180 million. And then the US counter-strike would kill 20 to 40% of the Russian population, or between 54 million and 108 million. So total death toll, 136 to 288 million. And then the flow-on effects, uh, like the starvation from lack of agriculture industry, would have been approximately 2 billion deaths. So a lot of, a lot of people, obviously. Present, preventing the deaths of hundreds of millions, if not billions of people, was a costly decision for Petrov. If he had been wrong and he somehow survived the American nuclear strike, he likely would have been executed for treason. Even though he was right, he was, uh, according to the Washington Post, relentlessly interrogated afterwards and never rewarded for its decision. So um, pretty sad, really. Uh, the Americans rewarded him, obviously. He got lots of medals from the Americans, but uh, the Russians, Russians didn't. And, um, and obviously there was a number of movies made about him as well. So um, an unsung hero, that guy, because I'd never heard of him, but he obviously saved a lot of people that day with the Lord's help. So we're going to read here in Acts 9. Um, we read about Ananias, and um, he had a great bearing uh, with the conversion of Saul, who later becomes Paul, and you know, pretty much uh, writes half of the New Testament, all of the uh, letters to the churches that uh, we love reading ourselves and we cherish it. But um, as we know, Saul, he was a, a very nasty piece of work. He wanted to kill Christians, and uh, Jesus appeared to him in verse 4, uh, and he says, And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, it is hard for thee to kick against, the, uh, kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So Jesus, he put a stop to the behaviour right away. 
and uh, he involved this uh, guy by the name of Ananias to help this uh, conversion come about. So um, he appeared to Saul as we read there and now we're going to actually uh, read about Jesus appearing to Ananias. Uh, this time it was in a vision. So verse 10 it says, And there was a certain disciple at Damas Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard of, by many of this man how much evil he has done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. So this was a, a completely logical uh, reaction by Ananias. You know, he's saying, Jesus, are you crazy? You know, this guy goes around killing people and you want me to go and meet with him face to face. And not only that, you know, to get up close and, and put my hand on him. Um, are you for real, Jesus? And he will continue on reading. It says, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So... <clears throat> Jesus just really stealing the situation but once again Ananias he's probably thinking what you know this is the guy that you're going to be picking to do your work Lord you know he's the exact he's the exact opposite of what you need Jesus um, it's a bit like sort of asking Ronald McDonald you know to go and start you know promoting the Whoppers or something like that it's unheard of and people are probably going to be a bit confused that hang on this guy's working for Maccus now he's working for Hungry Jacks and um, a bit like Saul here he's sort of working for the other team I guess but um, Ananias he obeyed Christ we'll read on verse 17 and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said brother Saul the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes that it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptised. And, um, you know, praise the Lord. It's a, it's a good ending to the story, and um, we know that Paul went on to do great things with the God's blessing. But, you know, it started with that unsung hero of Ananias, who despite, you know, probably being really, really scared about what he was about to do, he went ahead and uh, did what Jesus had asked him. And, um, you know, this chapter doesn't really go into detail about, um, you know, how much pacing and, or how nervous uh, Ananias was before um, he entered into the home where Saul was. You know, I'm, I'm sure Ananias, when he got there, he wasn't sort of going to be just barreling up to the door and kicking the door down and saying, Saul, listen to me, you know. I don't think he would have been doing that. I think he would have been pretty nervous, you know, before he went to see Saul. And I don't know about you, but, um, you know, when, a, when you know that you've got a tough conversation about to come, often you do pace. I'm a bit of a pacer. And, um, and you worry and you try and get out of it and you think, oh, I'll do it, I'll do it another time. And um, really, you know, this story, it's a good example for us to, um, you know, to, to go ahead and have those tough conversations because they're never easy. And um, recently at the most recent Bible bash that we had, um, we were talking about this, this uh, topic exactly, that, you know, if you see a, a brother or sister doing the wrong thing, um, you know, the easy option for us is to turn a blind eye to it and say, oh, you know, I won't worry about saying anything. But, you know, the much, the much harder option is to confront them about it and, uh, you know, and try and save their soul. And, you know, that sometimes means that we have to have a c tough conversation um, with them and it can be awkward, but uh, it can be what saves somebody's soul at the end of the day. And, and I'm sure for, uh, for Paul here, you know, in Acts 22, he recounts his conversion and he mentions, you know, what Ananias did for him. And I'm sure he was very, very grateful uh, for what Ananias did for, uh, for t having that tough conversation. In James 5, uh, I'll just quote it. It says uh, in verse 19, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. And, um, and I'm sure, you know, maybe that was us in that situation at one stage. Maybe we were sort of erring from the truth, not doing the right thing. Somebody came and spoke to us and corrected us. And I'm sure, you know, when we go, when Jesus Christ returns and, you know, it's going to be like a twinkling of an eye, we're going to be up in the air and I don't know what's going to happen up there. Maybe you might, you know, see that person and lock eyes with them and you're probably thinking, phew, you know, thank you so much for saying something to me that day because that saved my soul. Anyway, let's go to John 12. 
<clears throat> so we'll read, um, read a little bit about uh, Mary Magdalene. And if you're going to ask me, you know, how would you sum up Mary in a sentence, I would say that, you know, she was a brave, loyal friend and supporter of Jesus and, you know, particularly loyal. You can underline loyal for Mary. And, um, you know, as the time drew near that Jesus was to be uh, betrayed and then crucified and, and buried, um, most of his disciples had sort of run for the hills and fled um, because they were scared for their lives. But Mary, um, along with a, a small group of women, uh, you know, remained close throughout these proceedings and, uh, and that was a very brave thing to do. We can't underestimate that at all. And, you know, for Mary earlier, her brother Lazarus, he was raised from the dead by Jesus and she saw that. She saw that miracle before her eyes. And uh, when Jesus visited her home before that as well, um, you know, Martha, her sister, she was the one that chose to be busy. But Mary, on the other hand, sat at Jesus' feet and listened very intently to every word that he spoke. And uh, Mary, on different occasions, she had heard uh, Jesus speak about his death that was about to come. And, uh, and with that knowledge that she had, knowing that Jesus was going to die at one stage, we read of something very special that she does here. So we we'll read in, uh, in verse 1, it says, And then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with them. Then took Mary a pan of ointment of uh, spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odour of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my burying has she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye, not, uh, ye have not always. And <clears throat> this passage, you know, it really sums up her humility, that she was willing to uh, use this very expensive perfume to anoint Jesus' feet. And, uh, you know, when you think of somebody being anointed, generally it's their, their head which is anointed. Uh, but in this case, it was a feet. Uh, and normally, uh, the feet is a job for a servant or a slave to attend to people's feet in the Bible times. It was a, it was a menial task that sort of lacked prestige. And, um, and as we know, you know, Jesus did a lot of walking and... Uh, and he didn't have a nice pair of, you know, Asics Kayanos to do his walking in. Um, so his feet probably stank. No wonder he sort of taught the disciples to wash each other's feet. He's probably thinking, man, you guys stink or something. But we know there's a bigger message behind it in terms of serving. But, um, you know, people always ask me, you know, why on earth do you work with feet? Um, and I always answer, you know, it's not a glamorous job by any, me by any means, but it's something that I love doing. And Pastor Chris says, you know, my favourite chorus is, you shall never know defeat. So uh, that's straight out of the dad joke book, that one. But uh, anyway, back to Mary. Um, I think, you know, with this situation, I don't think Mary really wanted to make a big song and dance about it. You know, she wasn't saying, hey, gather around everybody, look what I'm about to do to Jesus. Um, she would have just been discreet, you know, she just would have just started doing this for him very humbly, um, knowing that Jesus was going to give his life soon. And it was just this little something that she wanted to do for Jesus near the time of his burial. And obviously, when people uh, back in the day uh, at burials, often historically perfume was used. And interestingly, uh, Nicodemus, who we read about in John 3, uh, you can read about it in John 19. He did a very similar thing to uh, Mary. Uh, this time after Jesus had died, you can read about that, that Nicodemus did a very similar act, so uh, very humble. And, um, and even though in this situation that we read here of Mary, she would have been trying to be quite discreet about it, um, the smell would have been so nice that you couldn't, have, you couldn't, you couldn't hide it. And obviously uh, it got the attention of Judas and, uh, and, you know, and he thought that she was crazy. You know, what on earth are you doing? We could have sold that, given the proceeds to the poor. And obviously for him, you know, I highly doubt that he was thinking of the poor, um, more so his own pockets. So he was showing a really different uh, attitude there. And for Judas, you know, Judas thought, you know, for, that Jesus, he was only worth 30 pieces of silver, but to Mary, Jesus was worth everything. 
Um, he healed her from a demon-possessed body. He raised her brother from the dead. He taught her and her sister valuable lessons. And, you know, Jesus, he meant so much to her that you can read about in John 20 that, you know, when she visited his tomb after he'd been crucified and found that his body wasn't there, that she just broke down in tears and, uh, you know, wanting to know where his body was. That's how much, you know, Jesus uh, meant to her. And, and when Jesus appeared to her, um, you know, she had so, so many tears in her, in her eyes that he couldn't see him clearly and he just thought he was a gardener. So, you know, Jesus meant a lot to her. And I guess the lesson that I get from this little passage here is, you know, may we have the same attitude. May we really appreciate Jesus and, and what he's done for us and, and really know his worth to us rather than just, you know, give him a two-minute thought in our day-to-day. And uh, often, you know, our days can get very busy and sometimes we might only give Jesus a two-minute thought, but really what I get out of this is, you know, may we really appreciate what he's done. Um, Let's go to Mark 12. So Jesus is just giving us a little parable here. We'll read it in verse 1. It says, And he began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard and set a hedge about it and digged a place for the wine fat, built a tower and let it to, out to the husbandman and went into a far country. And at the season he sent to the husbandman a servant that he might receive from the husbandman of the fruit of the vineyard. And they caught him and beat him and sent him away empty. And again he sent unto them another servant and at him they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. And again he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some, killing some. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said amongst themselves, This is the heir, come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. And they took him and killed him, cast him out of the vineyard, What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard uh, do? He will come and destroy the husbandman and will give the vineyard unto others. And have you not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. And this was the Lord's doing and it is marvellous in our eyes. Um, And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them and they left him and went their way. So... When you think of heroes or superheroes, some superheroes aren't very popular and, um, and some people don't really want saving. You think of Jesus and um, obviously Jesus in this parable was very much speaking of his own life, um, but you can definitely put Jesus in the rejected hero category. Um, not that I've ever seen it in real life, but obviously Hollywood makes it out that you see the fireman, you know, the cat stuck up the tree and they call the fire brigade and, you know, they go to all this effort to get the ladder out and they start climbing up the ladder and the cat doesn't want to be rescued. It just wants to stay up the tree. And praise the Lord that we're not the crazy cat, you know, that our lives, we've been rescued by Christ and we're very happy to be rescued. All the people said, um, but for many people, for the majority, in fact, Um, he's a rejected hero and uh, they're just like the crazy cats still stuck up in the tree and you know for what Jesus put him through himself through um, I'm sure you know there's this new generation of children who probably don't have a clue who Jesus is Um, the greatest hero ever to walk this planet and they don't know a thing about him and uh, school kids these days you know you're more that you're more of a hero than Jesus was if you you know come out of the closet or if you're you know if you're a sportsman and you come out of the closet or if you associate as a different gender you, you're seen as more of a hero and you know these people are put up on pedestals and respected highly whereas any mention of Jesus is squashed and you know almost frowned upon and um, you know when I was at school it was just males and females it's changed a lot these days uh, I've just got a few listed this is what you can be supposedly male female transgender gender neutral non-binary as gender a gender rather pan gender gender queer two spirit third gender you can also be all of these genders none of these genders are a combination of them um, and apart from the first four I hadn't even heard of any of the others and to be honest I don't want to know about it but the Bible is very clear that you're either male or female and uh, when you fill in a birth registration, which I did last year for my little daughter of a newborn, it asks you, what is the gender of your baby? And it only gives you two options. And guess what they are? Male and female. So, um, you know, we, we pray for people like this who are struggling to deal with their gender and their identity. And, you know, that's their choice to make. And the world these days, 
Uh, it's only going to get worse, you know. We can't really stop them from making these choices because people are going to do it. The Bible says the good's going to be called evil and the evil good. And, you know, we don't go walking down the street and if you see somebody walking up to you, you know, coming the other way, smoking a cigarette, we don't go sort of flicking it out of their mouth or we don't, you know, go up to people drinking a can of beer and pour it over their heads um, because we're not going to be too popular if we do that. And, um, and it's exactly the same, you know, it's a, it's a difficult subject, this one, but, you know, kids these days, it's a lot harder kids going to school these days than when I went, and, um, and you know, it's, it's difficult breaching this subject, but, you know, it's something that we can't stop. This is a behaviour, and, and, you know, this is a sin that is exactly the same as, uh, you know, other sins. God doesn't rate severity of sin, you know, he's not putting a murderer here and a, you know, Alcohol, alcoholic here, sin is sin to God and um, all we can do in these situations is, you know, we can just steer these people towards a relationship with God and, uh, and if, if these people that are struggling with these sort of things, if it's something that they really desire, a relationship with God, God will sort out the gender side of things, you know, because uh, he only gives two options. The Bible in 2 Corinthians 6 17 it says wherefore come out from among them be ye separate saith the lord and touch not the unclean thing and i will receive you and will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters saith the lord almighty so uh sons and daughters god's only got sons and daughters and we're very thankful about that aren't we let's go to jude we'll finish off <clears throat> so we're going to just uh tie all of these examples together so we had the little maid at the start we had ananias Mary Magdalene and Jesus and um, and what they all had in common was that they spoke the truth and they spoke up for what was right and in some cases it would have been very awkward and very terrifying situations and uh, perhaps not in Jesus case but uh, for the rest of them even though they probably had a lot of fear they overcame that and uh, the world is in need of saving and they need rescuing and uh, are we going to be that hero for them to steer them towards Jesus or are we just going to sort of walk on by and ignore their call for help and I sort of liken it to if you're going for a bush walk and you're walking along a cliff face and you see somebody you know uh, a man or a woman over the edge of the cliff face you know hanging on with their fingernails calling out to you for help uh, for help they're um, they're clutched onto the rock face and they haven't got long to hold on you know, would you go and immediately help them or are you going to sort of just sort of sit back and think, mm, I've just got to stretch my back out, you know, I don't want to injure my back, you know, helping you up or I just need to get a drink of water before I go and help you because, um, you know, if you, if you think about it too long, the time's gone, you know, it's too late. And really, when you think of, you know, rescuing and, and being a hero, it's, it's a fight or flight situation. Um, it's very spur of the moment and it's only for the brave and um, you know, thinking of fight or flight, I remember a youngies camp that we had quite some years ago. Uh, for those that may remember, we went to the Kurong and um, we caught a barge there. That was pretty good. Jeff organised the barge. Thank you, Jeff, that leaked. We all had wet shoes by the end of it. But anyway, Glorney was on this trip and Glorney had one job and Glorney's job was to bring the gas heater so we all stayed warm. So it was pretty cold in the morning and at night. So anyway... We're sitting around this uh, meeting in the morning. I'm struggling to keep the laughter in, Glorney. So Glorney set up his gas heater. He's got the big gas bowl at the bottom. He's got the nice little heater going at the top. We're all sort of sitting there singing choruses. And all of a sudden, the gas bottle goes boom. Now, it doesn't completely explode, but these flames are going anywhere. And I tell you what, I've never seen Glorney run as fast as I've seen him that way. He bolted up the sand dune. He scurried up the sand dune, and he's hiding behind this salt bush. Everybody's scattered. And, uh, and I was next to him. I, I got to admit, I was next to him. Um, but I distinctly remember when I was hundreds of metres away watching this uh, huge gas bottle on fire, I remember Jeff and Brody they, and probably some other brothers too, they went into the water, they got buckets of water and they put the fire out. And as we came back down, Glowney and I with our, tag, our towels between our legs there, uh, he hadn't screwed the, the gas hose into the heater properly, so that had all melted and that caused the huge fire. So Youngies camps are very safe, uh, nobody got hurt. Um, and I must admit, to put it Glorney in defence, I've done the same thing where, unfortunately, having a barbecue one day, I didn't screw the hose in properly and all these flames started coming off and fight or flight for me was to try and sort of whack them with my plastic gloves that I was holding and I didn't think. <laughs> Uncle Michael came off and turned the gas off and that put the fire out. So uh, I wasn't thinking. So the lesson behind it is stay safe around gas bottles, everybody. But anyway, let's get back to the scriptures. 
Um, we're going to read here Jude 21. I guess the thing that I want to finish off on was that, you know, may we pray to have opportunities to preach the gospel. And when they present in our day, you know, we only get this very brief moment to say something, you know. Um, and we either say it or we don't. Verse 21, it says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire and hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So, you know, may we just have the attitude of just being willing to help. You know, God isn't keeping a notepad in his top pocket thinking, oh, you know, you haven't really brought a lot of people to the Lord over the years. You know, God doesn't have that at all. Um, but he's looking for the attitude. That's what he looks for. And, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with being an unsung hero in the Lord. And, um, you know, maybe sometimes we don't always uh, take the opportunity when we can. I, I think of Peter, you know, Peter denied Jesus three times, but then you look at him the day of Pentecost and wow, he, he made a big difference that day. And may we not condemn ourselves when we don't take, take the opportunities, but, you know, may we just pray that we do, we do take them, that we become that unsung hero, just quietly going about doing the Lord's work, not sort of seeking the glory or the spotlight, but just happily serving the Lord because even though others might not see your labour, God does and he'll reward you for it. And I'll leave it there. Amen.